Good to see each and every one of you here tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about building bridges. And mainly, of course, thinking about building bridges to reach people with the gospel. We know that in much of our conduct with other people, our interaction with other people, that we, we might at times realize they don't have the same values that we do, whether it's people we work with, people we go to school with, people we do business with. And maybe sometimes the inclination is just to say, well, they're just different than me and there's nothing I can do about it. And it, and it may be that eventually we reach that point. But I also want us to realize that there are people who need the gospel who may be in very different positions in, the, in their lives and things they're doing and things they're involved in. And doesn't mean that they don't need the gospel. In fact, it means just the opposite. They really need God. They really need the gospel of Christ. And we know that the Bible teaches us that we should be separate from the world. And of course, there is kind of a natural separation that occurs in those that are in Christ from those that are in the world, just as far as some things you're not going to do that they do. And maybe even the things that they say or things that they want to talk about that you don't consider appropriate for a Christian to be talking about or joking about or things like that. But in, and, and in, there never is any reason why we should compromise this principle of holiness that is emphasized in many places in the Bible. One of them in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 16, where it says, As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, which in the New King James Version says, Do not be deceived. Evil, com evil company corrupts good habits. Or as the American Standard Version says, Be not deceived. Evil companionship corrupt good morals. And we might even use these verses to kind of warn our kids, you know, and say, be careful of who you pick for friends because they can certainly have an influence on the choices you make and, and the direction your life goes. And I've mentioned it before, but, uh, you know, when I was doing some Bible classes among the uh, those in the drug rehab, that was one of the things that was really emphasized is you better change your friends on who you're hanging out with or you're going to end up right in the same position. But there's an overreaction to this, and that is that when we start just thinking in terms of isolating ourselves completely from the world around us, then we're not going to be able to be a good influence on them. And God doesn't want us to isolate ourselves. In fact, even praying for his apostles in John chapter 17, and we think about how much concern he had for them, how many things he says in the context of this, where he's, where he's talking to them and he's also praying for them. Uh, in chapter 17 of John in beginning in verse 15, he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And so sometimes people have kind of just given that description of where we are as Christians. It applied to the apostles. It applies to us as well. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. And as we think about that, it is also important that we realize when he said, I don't want you to take them out of the world. Imagine this. Imagine if Jesus had taken his followers and including the apostles, but even the other people that were following him at the time, that were devoted followers of his disciples. What if he took them and he isolated them in some kind of a monastery or some kind of an island and had, okay, we've got them over here and they're not having contact with anybody else. We're going to keep them from being polluted by the thoughts and the ideas of everybody else. And you realize, then it would not have had the effect of being able to influence and reach other people. So while we do want to be careful how the world affects us, we also have to realize that we still need to be an influence on the world around us. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that is talking about the discipline that is exercised toward a brother or sister in Christ who's not living in the way that God has directed them to. And then he, he says this in verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean the sexually immoral people of this world 
or with the covetous or with the extortioners or idolaters. Since then, he said, you would need to go out of the world. And when I say out of the world, that doesn't just mean off the planet. It means that Jesus was not expecting us to isolate ourselves from from the world around us. We're going to need to be interacting with them to be able to be a good influence to them. And if we're not careful, what we do is we can tend to, in some instances in our own lives, start building a wall that makes it difficult really to help the lost. Now, don't think this is some kind of a political thing. I'm not talking building walls. That's a whole different issue when it comes to the national security. I'm talking about relationship walls. That maybe we can end up putting up walls that, that people can't even get any contact with us or any, any real information from us because we're, we're overreacting in the way that we're not being part of the world. And we think about this with God. I mean, obviously, man's separation from God is because of His holiness. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is His ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities, your lawlessness, your another word for sin, have separated you from your God and your sins have hid, hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. He is absolutely holy. It, it is not, not, uh, at least not a little bit holy. He's absolutely holy. First John 1 and 5, this is the message which we heard from Him. And declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. So if we think about God maintaining His holiness, He had every right to just separate, eternally keep Himself away from unholy people, from sinful people. And He had every right to build a wall, but instead He built a bridge. And that bridge took the form of several things. If we think about the way that God built a bridge to Himself, things that required a plan... They required a way for that to happen, but it began with love. John 3, verse 16, everybody's aware of that. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Paul in the book of Romans goes on to emphasize that this love that God has is extended while we were yet sinners, while we were His enemies, while we were separated from Him. It also took the form of grace. Unmerited favor, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That is, this grace, unmerited favor, this blessing that He's offering us is not something that is of our merit, of us earning, of us deserving, but rather of His, His goodness to us. It also took the form of sacrifice, of course, that of Jesus that's described in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. I mean, this, we, we can't emphasize enough how much that sacrifice was that He made for us. And it was about bringing people to Him. It, it took the form of mercy. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which He have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It also took the form of forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Now maybe that's a good verse to kind of segue into. These are things that are a quick summary. They're not, we didn't go into a lot of detail about them. You're familiar with them. I think everybody here tonight is familiar with all of those concepts as it relates to God reconciling man to himself. And we realize that this bridge that God created is a way to bring man to where he is. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our connection with God is through Christ. And God lets us choose whether or not we're going to walk over that bridge. Uh, he doesn't force us. He, he gives us the opportunity to do it. And we must, though, when we do cross that bridge, meet his conditions. I think there's this Resistance sometimes when people look at these conditions that God sets forth as far as things like repentance and baptism. 
that people are resistant to it because they want to say, oh, well, if I do that, then I'm earning my salvation. There, that's not any comparison to earning our salvation. It's, it's the conditions that God gives us that has to do with us being united with Christ and receiving the benefits of this bridge that he's built to himself. And salvation is still undeserved, but it is not unconditional. There are conditions that we need to meet. And we realize that this means that indeed, as Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. If we don't believe, anything else beyond this is irrelevant. We need to repent. We need to change our mind in regard to those things that are against the will of God, that may be the conduct and the habits of our life, that may be our way of thinking, that may be our way of, of looking at God, that we repent of those things. We change our mind in those things. As Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. We need to be willing to confess him. And while Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 just simply expresses it this way, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, we realize that there is a need for us to initially acknowledge and declare our commitment to following him. But there's other times that it may be that we're in the presence of people that it's not so easy to do and be willing to confess him before men as he said in Mark, Matthew chapter 10, that if we confess him before men, he'll confess us, confess us before his Father in his heaven. If we deny him before men, he'll deny us before his Father in heaven. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, he says, You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as are baptized into Christ, did put on Christ. And we need to remain faithful, even to the point of death, as Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. So we see that God had this plan, this way to bring us back to Him. But we also have a responsibility in these bridges because we're the ones left on this earth and God intends us to be involved in reaching out to other people. And we need to build bridges to help others come to where we are. If we are in Christ, we're saved, we do want others where we are. Now, you know, I could go back and say all those things that we just talked about and you, people need to evaluate, am I really where I need to be with God? But otherwise, when we recognize that we are, we certainly want to and should, should not be ashamed, should not be shy about wanting to help other people to be where we are. But sometimes we have to tear down some walls. There are some walls that we can build that make people where they don't even want to talk to us. You know, if we come across as being arrogant... If we demonstrate hypocrisy, that's maybe the one. Those two things right there are probably the things I hear most that turn them off. And they may not be absolutely accurate the way people are saying it. What I mean is, it may be a perception they have that's not real, but sometimes they perceive Christians as being arrogant. Or sometimes they perceive Christians as being hypocrites. And while on the one hand we can say, you know what, I'm not perfect, and I do mess up, and we need to acknowledge that. And maybe that would help to take care of both aspects of that. But, it, but on the other hand, we need, to be, we need to realize how when we're saying we're a Christian and then our actions demonstrate otherwise, it will have a negative effect. It'll keep us from being able to help people. And if we're insincere, insincerity, if we don't really mean it, whether we're, and when I mean insincere, not just in regard to our Christianity, but in regard to our interest in helping other people. And maybe sometimes just things like rudeness and carelessness of not really thinking about how our words have an effect on other people. Now, these are some of the walls that can stand between us and being able to effectively reach other people with the gospel. Let's just think about God's example and the things that we mentioned before. All the same things that God demonstrated to bring us back to Him. It began with love. Right? His love for us is the motivation for Him sending His Son to die for us. And of course, the Bible emphasizes the need in regard to our efforts toward others. The motive needs to be love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Even though we may use the passage, you know, the love chapter, right? All the things that describes the qualities of love. But he begins with this when it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. 
you know, you think about the context of that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, chapter 12 and chapter 14 are both talking about these spiritual gifts that were about giving, edif- helping to edify the congregation, helping to encourage them, helping to, to, to build them up and solidify their, their faith. But he says, even if you have beyond these kind, you have tongues not only of men, but of angels, but you don't have love. He says, you're just making noise. And, and then in the next verse he says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now think about that, not just in relation to just using some examples of great things, but notice how much they're connected with the life of a Christian in helping other people. And he says, if our motivation is not care for them, and when you think about Bible, biblical agape love, it's about wanting the best for people. I really am interested in their well-being. I'm not doing this to get brownie points. I'm not doing this to just make myself look good. I'm doing this because I care about them. And it will affect the way we say things. It will affect how we come across if we're not motivated by care for them, by truly loving them. You know, I've heard this quote a number of times. I was surprised somebody said Teddy Roosevelt was the first one to say it. I don't know if he was or not, okay? (laughs) I haven't been able to run it down. But it's a great quote. People don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. They don't, you know, that, and that's just the truth. And it's, it should be true concern, not just a gimmick, but a true concern for their well-being. So, so love is, is where it sh- should begin. Our interest in helping other people should be because in bringing people to Christ is we care about them and we care about their soul. We should also realize that just like God extended grace to us, sometimes we need to extend grace to others. If you think about the principle of undeserved favor, First, Second Peter chapter three and verse eighteen says of us that we should grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. To grow in grace. Now, there's a lot of ideas about what that means. Some would say the grace there is talking about favor, and that's a term that is sometimes grace is sometimes translated favor. So maybe maybe the focus in that verse is <clears throat> that it's talking about living more acceptably to God. But, but also consider this, that growing grace may, may be just a reminder of a principle that we know we need to have, which is that we are willing to be compassionate toward other people. Extend some undeserved favor to them. That is that we, we give people more than they deserve. Do we, do we give people more than they deserve or is there kind of like a, a cutoff point? And go, okay, that's it. <laughs> You know, you don't deserve any more of my attention. You don't deserve any more of my, my effort to help you. And, and, and it may take a giving of ourselves to be willing to, to extend that to, to those that, that need Christ. It, it also means we need to be willing to sacrifice. And if Paul goes through quite a bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, talking about his own sacrifices that he made in in. Promoting the gospel. And as he talks about this, he, he emphasizes, look, I have the right not to do these things. But he, he adapted himself to the cultures where he was, whether it was the Jews or the Gentiles, whether it was the, 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 the bond or the free. He says, though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And he went out of his way. I mean... We think about the way in which Paul often offended people because he was telling them the truth. But he also did not go out of his way to offend them in unnecessary ways. And I want you to read this with me from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. A few verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 beginning in verse 19 using a pew Bible that's on page 799. He says in verse 19, Though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. 
To those who are under the law as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. This I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Now he gives some examples in the context. There were times when he um, received support for complete support for what he was doing, and other times he received um, he he worked with his own hands making tents. Um, it's interesting too that in regard to the Corinthians, he and this is part of the context there. He didn't take support from them, which is unusual because this was one of the richest areas in the world. And I don't know if that was something God told him to do or if it was his own judgment, but whatever it was, he went out of his way not to be taking money from them for this reason. Everybody that came to town was in it for the money. (laughs) That's what Corinth was about. It was about money. It was about... Uh, you know, this philosophers, it was about the, um, um, you know, it was about these, these, these earthly things. And, and he did not ask support. He's taken, he's taken support from this support from this little group up in Philippi while he's there. So he's not burdening them. He didn't do that because he didn't have a right to be supported. He did that because he didn't want that them to be to the message of the gospel to be tarnished by where he's at and what he's doing there. And we think about it in ways that he was a Jew to a Jew and a Greek to a Greek. He, he went out of his way not to be offensive to the Jews. Even though, you know, when he goes back to Jerusalem, remember, he goes back to Jerusalem and he goes in and he takes a vow and he, and he, and he all makes an offering and he, he shaves his head, all these kind of things. And he's doing it to keep not to keep from being offensive. And then they accused him of bringing an uncircumcised Gentile into the temple, which was false. But that's what they, the basis that they arrested him on. And he did face a lot of problems and he gave up a lot of things. He was willing to sacrifice a lot of the comforts that he had when he was persecuting Christians and getting pretty much everything he needed. And he gives this as an illustration and reminding them of some of the things he's asking them to do that related to this meeting, eating of meat sacrificed to idols. That maybe, maybe it's not such a good idea to eat certain things when it's going to cause a barrier between you and somebody that you can influence. What is meat? Who cares? And a number of the things that he addresses in the chapter, or in the chapters that follow and chapters before, when he's reminding them of these personal sacrifices they need to make in consideration of others to help reach them the, with, the, with the gospel. And he uses that phrase. I'm going to read it again. I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Whatever it takes. <laughs> he wanted to reach people. He wanted to win them, win them for God. And of course, forgiveness, being willing to forgive. We read this verse while ago in Ephesians chapter four and verse 32, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. We need to let go of grudges. We need to let go of things that we have that are interfering with our relationship with others and Forgive mistreatment. It may be go back to grace and give people more than they deserve. There's some specific bridges also that we can involve ourselves in that just are about, maybe we might just describe the simple decency toward others, acts of kindness. Um, it may, maybe you've heard the phrase random acts of kindness. <laughs> you know, it should be that we're kind to people. It shouldn't be that Christians are known as being the curmudgeons, <laughs> you know, the ones that are always just don't care about anybody else. I don't think that fits you. But we need to realize that in many ways that can be the thing that helps to bridge the gap. Being thoughtful toward others, realizing there's somebody that needs some attention, realizing that there's somebody that needs 
some thoughtfulness toward them and to have a personal interest in them without any expectations. Those are things that can be helpful, as well as being willing to listen more than we talk. God gave us two ears and one mouth. Does that say we need to listen twice as much as we speak? Probably. (laughs) And avoid unnecessary conflicts. There's going to be conflicts. But avoid, avoid the unnecessary ones and think of the benefit of whatever activities that we have. Not just as something we enjoy doing, whatever it might be. But realize that this can be a benefit of us getting to know people and being able to reach out to them. And always think souls. There was a guy that did a personal evangelism class. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. But he, came, he went around different places and was talking about it. And he had this phrase. He said, think souls. You know, when you're seeing people, when you're interacting with people, when you're doing business with people, when you're, when you're having contact with other people, don't just think of them as just this body standing there. But, but they have a soul and they have an accountability to God and see them, see these souls and see them as individuals and the importance of what we can do to help them. So as we conclude the lesson, we just want to ask the question and you ask yourself this. I'm not asking you to answer I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. I'm not even making any accusations about anybody. I'm just simply saying, let's ask ourselves and say, what am I building? Am I building bridges or am I building walls? And so thinking about that and the influence and the effect we can have on the world around us, I hope we'll think in ways that we can indeed build those bridges and help bring people to where we are, help bring them to Christ. And if we can help... With that tonight, we want to encourage you, if you're not a Christian, to become one, if you need to return to Him, if we can help you in any way, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.